All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, you already know what time it is. And right here, right now, we actually have Act 1 live on the line. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, man. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Best I can possibly be, man. Just enjoying my weekend down here in Canada, man. Not much going on. Just uh, interviewing amazing, amazing artists like yourself, man. So it's definitely an honor. Thank you, dude. I appreciate that. But I know you're a busy guy, Axel, so I'm going to dive right into this broadcast, but I want to take you back to the very beginning of your amazing career thus far. I actually read that you became an MC at the young age of 13 during the golden era of hip-hop, and you were and also in New York at that, so you were right in the mecca of the very beginning of hip-hop. I was wondering if you can actually tell us a bit more about the early beginnings of your career, and of course, what really inspired you just to kind of pursue just a career in hip-hop? Yeah, man. Um, you know, like you said, it's it sort of, uh, I was growing up in the thick of it, like during that era where hip hop was everywhere in New York and it was such a, like, it was such a culture everywhere you looked and you could just feel it all around. And me and my friends were like such music fans at a young age. We just really enjoyed music in general, but especially hip hop, you know, from like eight, nine, ten years old, I can remember just you know, using my allowance to get whatever the newest, you know, hip hop album was and whatever my parents would uh, let me let me buy that wasn't explicit or whatever. So like, you know, just a fan of music. And then once, you know, the 90s uh, boom came around, you know, 94, Illmatic and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, 36 Chambers, like me and my friends just really, you know, record store every day after school and, and buy records. And we just really were big fans. And then, you know, if you're a fan of something for long enough and if you really appreciate it and you study it, you know, you, you want to try it out after a while. You know, if you were a big fan of the NBA, at some point you're going to want to go buy a ball and uh, shoot around and see see how you do. So that, that's kind of how we got into sort of transitioning from fans of the culture to, you know, wanting to try our hand at it and see how we did. And, and we started right in, uh, you know, around 12, 13 years old and just rhyming over instrumentals from – vinyl we had or you know the b side of cassettes back then cassette singles used to have the instrumental and we would just use those beats to try to make our own songs and stuff and um you know over time you know it was something we did as a hobby and it became you know for me uh, i did it with a lot of cats who kind of fell off over time but you know for me it became sort of a lifelong um, passion and something that i you know i've been uh you know always pursuing ever since and I have to ask as well, man, because obviously, like 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 you said, you were in the mecca of it. You were in New York, golden golden era, golden era of hip hop. During your travels as a young as a young MC, did you ever actually come across any of the legendary hip hop artists that you actually grew up listening to? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, like I said, we were we were fans first and foremost. So we would do a lot of um, going to you know in store signings, and you know back then it was really big for record labels to send the, the artists to the to do in store and you can meet them and a lot of times in New York especially because hip-hop wasn't the pop culture that it is now it was a it was a, um, a smaller thing so you know you could go to you know an in-store signing and and be right next to Nas or you know right next to Organized Confusion or right next to you know Del the Funky Homo Sapien and, and talk to them and cipher with them you know a lot of times Fat Beats we used to go to Fat Beats which was like a legendary record store back then in New York and you know they would do open mic at the at the signing and you know it'd be like dudes from nonfiction and dudes from, you know, uh, indelibles and stuff, just passing you the mic and you would spit. Um, Arsonists was a big group back then in, in New York, and I remember one of the dudes passed me the mic and I spit it first, and then he was like, what's your name again? And he, he sort of like, you know, re, you know, shot at me out. So there was those moments where, you know, you really felt tapped into the culture, even though you were a young, new artist, because, you know, it was accessible to you. It wasn't so separated. Uh, you know, you didn't need to have a, re you know, a record deal or, be on a big show in order to get on. You could just sort of, you know, be in the culture and be around that that whole vibe. You know, it was just the way it was back then in New York. And also as well, on, on October 24th of 2016, you actually released your 2005 track uh, titled Survival Lessons that was, at, that was actually featuring the late, great uh, Vintage. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners the story behind this throwback track. And of course, what actually made you, deci made you decide to release that song in 2016? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Vintage was uh, going back to my earlier story about how we were fans and we wanted to try our hand at rapping. Uh, Vintage was the first one in our crew that sort of was like, you know, I want to be an MC, and he started writing. And because he was doing it and my boy Design was doing it at the time, that's sort of what made me be like, you know what, I'm going to get on these tracks too with them. And, and 
Uh, I always tell people at the time, if they would have laughed me out the room or sort of, uh, you know, told me, like, nah, you're not good at this, I probably would have gave it up right there on the spot. But Vintage actually was like, yo, you're really nice. You're a good writer. You should stick with it. He encouraged me. Um, and through the years, that was the homie. He was a close personal friend of mine in real life outside of hip-hop, and he was a collaborator, you know, through my whole life um, and part of my group from when we were about 13 to when he passed away when I was about 27 years old. So uh, Vintage, always uh, a big influence of mine and, and, and uh, you know, lifelong friend. So um, Survival Lessons was one of the last songs that me and him recorded together before he passed away. So I re-released that uh, later on once I was reestablishing myself in hip-hop and putting out new music, I re-released that song uh, just as an homage to him and to sort of, you know, I try whenever I can to sort of put his name out there so people um, know of him because he never really got the chance to uh, to shine and to do that himself. Now that he's gone, he's no longer with us. So uh, just, just my way of uh, re-releasing that song and, and trying to get some vintage uh, stuff out there to people. A tribute. And I got to say it as well, it definitely is a phenomenal song. So if listeners haven't actually heard this song, definitely head on over to his SoundCloud and check this out. It actually is a phenomenal release. Thank you, man. And also on August 10th of 2017, uh, you actually released the song titled Spin a Rooney. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners the backstory behind the song. And of course, what, what, what actually made you decide to create a Booker T influence song? Um, yeah, shout, shout out to my homie Keva. Um, me and him were trying to do something for a long time. He was a dude I went to high school with, and he was an MC for for a long time as well. And he sort of um, there was a period of time between about 2009 and 2014-ish where I kind of uh, put hip hop aside and focused mostly on my my um, day career, my day job. And um, while I was sort of semi retired from hip hop and from music. Kevin was actually, you know, pounding the pavement and doing shows and, and, you know, selling mixtapes, and he was really out here doing it. And for years, me and him were, were trying to get together and do a track. Um, and that uh, sort of mixtape song that we did uh, with the Nicki Minaj beat just kind of came together. Uh, we were both big wrestling fans in high school. Uh, I say a line in the song, uh, re- you know, referencing Spinner Rooney. Um, so it just kind of came naturally to make that reference to... to uh, Booker T into wrestling, and me and Kevin got together and did that little sort of like party party song mixtape track. And I got to say as well, I, I I grew up on like you know Booker T, WCW, and uh, WWF days and whatnot, man. So just when I saw that, I was like, man, just for my personal reasons, I have I have to ask about that, man, because Booker T was one of my favorite wrestlers, and of course Harlem Heat, man, you can never go wrong with that legendary tag team. Right, right, and and you know, shout out to um, shout out to all the wrestling fans because I'm still a big wrestling fan to this day. But obviously, you know, same as hip hop, uh, the '90s was sort of the golden era of uh, of wrestling and, and the WCW WWF wars and stuff. But um, anybody who's a wrestling fan and, and appreciates that kind of stuff in your hip hop, um, I actually just did a new track uh, with it with, with the homie Euphonic Aspect, and the song is called uh, Power Bomb, and it's on it's on Spotify, it's on streaming, and there's a video as well that I edited with all old school wrestling clips and stuff. And basically the song is us just spinning battle raps, but all the sort of metaphors and, and punchlines and stuff are uh, wrestling centered around nineties wrestling and, and um, things like that. So uh, if you hit my YouTube or if you hit up Spotify, you can, you can uh, find that, that track that came out about a month ago, maybe. And um, it's for the wrestling, for the wrestling heads that are, uh, you know, that, are, that relate to us on hip hop and wrestling. And one last question I have just pertaining to the wrestling aspect and whatnot, man, before we actually move on. Because I do know you came here to talk about hip-hop and not wrestling, but I have to ask, man, what is your take on AEW, man? Because I do know it's kind of like a hit and miss with individuals, man. Oh, uh, yeah, it's funny you, it's funny you ask. Uh, I actually am a huge AEW fan. Um, uh, I think it really does harken back. Anyone who's hearing the sound of my voice right now, uh, I, you know, I'm kind of evangelical about this, like, to me, if you love that 90s uh, wrestling and you f- sort of fell off over time because it changed, I feel AEW is definitely more like the WCW stuff that we grew up on than, than um, what the current WWE stuff is like. So I actually always tell old school heads, like, they should check out AEW. Like, if you grew up on wrestling and you liked, you know, all that stuff, uh, AEW is definitely more in line with the kind of wrestling that I enjoy than um the WWE product was, you know, a little more family friendly now and, and a little, you know, a little more cartoony or whatever. 
But yeah, I enjoy AEW. I think they I think they do a good job. There's actually a lot of AEW references and uh, clips and stuff in that in that um powerbomb video that I just talked about. So I definitely try to throw some AEW in there for the you know the fans that are keeping up with the current uh, wrestling stuff. And also as well, on October 30th of 2021, you actually released the amazing seven-track EP titled I Apologize in Advance. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners the story behind this amazing album. And of course, where can we actually buy or stream ourselves a copy of it today? Uh, I Apologize in Advance was was sort of like my um, big return to, because like I said, I, I sort of took time off. Um, between 2009 and 2014-ish, and then I started making music again and getting back into it, but I hadn't really established myself in the new era as far as, like, social media. And, you know, hip-hop is a different game now. It's very, like, TikTok-based, Instagram-based, and streaming and all that stuff. So I apologize was sort of my first, uh, like, like, I'm going to sort of use this as my um, first release back into the culture and, and try to get my name out, um, and I made, you know, I made CDs, and I put it on streaming, and I put it on Bandcamp, and I put it on SoundCloud, and I was just really sort of trying to use it as a calling card, uh, just seven tracks that kind of show what I can do, the old school boom bap kind of stuff. There's a there's a tribute song on there called 94 Energy. That's basically what me and you were talking about earlier, just the living in the Mecca during the golden era, like there's, you know, that kind of song. Um, but yeah, I apologize. It sort of came about during the pandemic because... Uh, I was trying to reestablish myself in the hip-hop community, and here I was stuck in the house with lots of time on my hands. So, you know, I got to work. The homie, uh, Nam Hu, who's a producer, I know him from my personal life, but he's also a producer who used to, he grew up with NEMS, and he used to produce tracks for NEMS, and he comes from that whole Coney Island, Brooklyn hip-hop scene. Um, you know, he had beats laying around that he wasn't using. He told me I could use them if I wanted to, and you know, he didn't really expect much, and then next thing you know, I, I got him seven tracks um, that I thought were pretty strong, and, and we put it out, and uh, it was really well received. It's, it's available on all streaming services. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Music. It's on my Bandcamp, which you can find in my Instagram link uh, in my profile. But, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite projects that I've done to this day because it, was, it came out of such a personal um, kind of place where I was just stuck in the house, and I was like, I'm going to make the kind of hip-hop that I love, and... I didn't overthink it, and uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud of that project. It's a, it's a good one. And I gotta say as well, I, I really enjoyed the track, the, like the first song, uh, "Meditation." Man, I found that was a great way to kind of like get into the album, and I, I really think that was a great, great entry into that, into that entire project. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, "Meditation" is. Um, it's funny because the song is not that deep. It's just sort of like a hip hop song with a, with a with a rock and beat, but. Um, that, that phrase, music is my meditation, uh, sort of informs a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking on, on my, about on my next project. It's, it's just sort of like music has always been like therapy to me. And, um, you know, I don't take it super seriously, and, I, and, I, and I, 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 it's a passion of mine, but I don't think you should overthink art or music. I think you should just make it. Um, but I still do see it as, you know, ever since I was 13, like I said, and I started writing, I really do see it as like, you know, writing my my feelings down, writing my thoughts down is like a therapy. It's like a meditation to me. Um, so yeah, setting setting off the album just by letting people know, like you know, this is not just music. This is this is more than that. You know what I'm saying? And also, as well, aside from actually being an MC, you are also a vinyl collector. And I know you mentioned that briefly at the beginning of the interview. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners a bit more about your collection. And of course, what was the very first vinyl record that you ever actually remember purchasing? Oh, yeah. But I'm, a, I'm a huge music fan in general and, and a vinyl head. And, again, going back to the earlier part of our conversation, just talking about me and the homies going to, you know, Fat Beats after school, um, I have a lot of those sort of, like, classic records that were, like, white label, you know, the original MF Doom, the first pressing of MF Doom's first song ever that, you know, I bought at the time, just not even think much of it, and now it's, you know, like a collector's item. So... A lot of that Fat Beats era sort of white label stuff that they were putting out at the time that was very limited run and very, like, local New York stuff, you know, now MF Doom's a legend. So it's like, you know, having Company Flow records and MF Doom records and, um, you know, nonfiction records from that era that, you know, no one thought very much of at the time. Uh, but now it's just like, you know, this gem in my collection uh, so it, it, pay, it definitely paid to be a you know old school head from from back in the day and, and always be up on that. Um, but yeah, I think 
I think um, the first vinyl I ever bought was probably, I want to say, Arsonist. They were like a New York uh, hip-hop group at the time, and I bought one of their white labels from Fat Beats when I was about maybe 14. Um, I had vinyl before that that I had inherited from my mom. To this day, I still have my mom's um, original copy of Thriller, Michael Jackson Thriller, that she used to play when I was a kid. And I still that's the that's the copy of Thriller that's still in my collection to this day. So, yeah, I, I hold on I hold on to stuff, and um, you know sometimes it pays off. And also as well on May on May fourth of two thousand twenty two, yourself and uh, SoCal actually teamed up to release the amazing seven track collaborative album uh, titled "The Beauty and Chaos." I was wondering what is the story behind this album, and of course, how did yourself and SoCal originally get connected? Uh, I had put out a project right after I apologized in advance. I tried to uh, follow it up with a, with another EP um, that I did called Vintage. That was a shout out to my homie who I who I uh, spoke about earlier. And um, that little EP on that EP, I did a song with uh, Show Rocker, who's like a very well known Connecticut artist. And um, me and him did a sort of you know team up. And SoCal had worked with Show Rocker, and he heard the song on Show Rocker's page. And he reached out to Show Rocker to ask, like, you know, who's Act One and what's that about? And uh, they they linked, they you know, Show Rocker linked me to him, and we had a conversation. And SoCal asked me if I could do a song for his uh, mixtape, and I turned that around in about a week. And he liked the way it came out so much that he asked me, you know, what what do you think about doing a couple more songs? Which you know, over time turned into you know seven more songs. And um, the, the first song we did together was Beauty and the Chaos. Uh, which is why the album wound up being called that. The title track was the the title track on the EP is the song that I did for his mixtape that wound up, you know, sort of sparking this whole project we did together. But yeah, I, uh, I that's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite projects I've done to date. Uh, his production is just sick, and I'm going to be working with him more on my upcoming project. But he's just a super super talented dude, um, and he really brings something to the production end I think that really like adds to the whole sound because I'm a very old school boom bap type rapper um punch lines that kind of thing but then when you layer it with that kind of music quality you know the musicality of his production and the sort of like the old school soul samples and stuff I think it really just takes it to another level so uh definitely looking forward to working with him more uh in the future we have a couple joints coming out uh, pretty soon that are that are definitely going to follow up on that beauty and the chaos momentum thank you and I do have to ask, this, just as pertaining to this project, with this being one of the most recent releases, do you guys actually have any hard copies available, like CDs or vinyl? That way the fans can actually uh, purchase uh, purchase these? I actually, yeah, I actually did, never did um, press up CDs for um, The Beauty and the Chaos, but we, we sold it exclusively for about four or five months. You could only get the album from purchasing it through Bandcamp, purchasing the digital copy. Uh, and it sold it sold really well. It was it, it did very well, and I, I was surprised because I know a lot of people in the current industry will sort of advise you against selling your music, and there's a whole movement towards streaming. Uh, and I do like having my music on streaming because obviously, uh, you know, people being having access to your music is the point, and you want as many people as possible to be able to hear it. But we tried selling it just to see how it would go, and it went very well. Um, so uh, shout out to everybody who actually supported the project and paid. If you want to pay for it and show love and, and support, you can still go to my band camp and it, you can still purchase it, but it is um, available on Spotify, Apple Music, all the, all the you know, sort of um, streaming services for free as well. And also as well, before I also saw, I saw as well that before the end of 2022, you actually have a big collaboration project in the works. I was wondering, from what you are allowed to speak about when it comes to this project, can you tell us what our listeners can expect from this project when it does drop to the general public? Yeah, I, I was uh, hoping to be able to sort of announce fully what it was, but we're not quite there yet. But um, but I can say, uh, me and this person who's a very well-known uh, MC, and he's very respected and sort of beloved, in the, especially in the sort of Instagram um, underground hip hop community. Uh, he had a lot of support and a lot of uh, fans. And me and him, much like me and SoCal, me and him sat down to sort of do a five song EP, which actually wound up evolving into a 15 song album with a lot of features and a lot of crazy producers on it. It just turned into a whole beast of a project. And it's it's one of my favorite 
projects I've done to date because it really does harken back to that uh, era that I was talking about earlier. Like, you know, when you try to make music now, a lot of times you, you try to keep the spirit of the music that you love to make, but then sort of modernize it and sort of tap into what people are into now. But this project is very, like, 90s hip-hop, underground. It has this, like, sort of Wu-Tang vibe. Me and him were definitely going for, like, a Ghostface and Raekwon sort of duet kind of old-school vibe. So it has that, you know, only built for Cuban links, purple tape dynamic to it. Um, I'm really proud of it, and I think people are going to find out a lot more about it in the coming weeks because we're, we're actually mixing it as we speak. Um, but I can't quite announce the name of it or what it is yet, but if people want to follow me on Instagram at Almighty Act One, just stay tapped in, and definitely in the coming weeks there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of news surrounding that project. And also, Act One, i gotta, I got to ask, man, what is next for yourself? Like, is there anything we happen to miss during tonight's broadcast? Anything else you do still want to talk about or promote? What well, we still got you here live on 97.7 FM this evening. Uh, yeah, for, for me right now, my, 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 uh, focus is set on finishing up this collaboration, uh, project so I can hit everybody with that. We're really proud of that. There's going to be merchandise surrounding that and, and physical releases and everything. So, um, right now that's currently what I'm really focused on, but right behind that is coming my next solo project, which is going to be the first full album I've done in a long time. Instead of being a little EP, like I apologize or vintage or the beauty and the chaos. Um, this is going to be a full 10-track album um, with a lot of crazy producers. Um, I'm working with Too Busy, who produced all of Billy Dan's from MLP's uh, last project. I'm working with SoCal again. Uh, I'm working with PhD Beats. I'm just, it's, just, it's just like, a, like a, a dope collection of producers, and there's going to be some really dope big features on there. Um, I have a song with Joel Ortiz from Slaughterhouse, um, Marv One, working with Bro God. So there's just... We, it's going to be sort of like my first big album. Um, I was hoping to get it out by the end of the year, but I think this is probably looking more like early next year. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's called Shit That Keeps Me Up at Night, and it's, it's going to be like my most personal sort of, again, like I spoke earlier about music being my meditation and my therapy, this album is definitely going to be almost like a therapy session. It has some dark subject matter. It's going to have some, you know, relationship stuff. So just getting a little deep and working with some of the best uh, MCs and producers in the game. So I'm really excited about shit that keeps me up at night. That's going to drop 2023 early probably. Um, and besides that, just, you know, pounding the pavement, trying to do shows again now that the pandemic is, you know, lightening up, trying to get out to different places and, and just spread the spread the Act One brand and the name and just, you know, keep growing my fan base and keep growing the, the audience and, doing things like sitting and chopping it up with you so that, you know, just trying to get the word out about the music and, and the art. And uh, that's probably, that's, that's what I'm going to focus on for the next year or so. So. And also this is the time of the interview that I give a chance for the individual that does slide into the radio station airwaves, just a chance to give like shout outs to whomever they want to give shout outs to, but most of all your social media handles. That way our listeners can follow you and stay updated on everything. Almighty act one, if they're not already doing so. Appreciate that. Um, I'm at Almighty Act One on both TikTok and Instagram. I'm definitely more active on Instagram. Um, and you could, you know, if you if you need to book me, if you need a feature, if you just want to chop it up, if you you know whatever you need from me, just hit me up on there. I'm very active. I'm in the DMs. I'm, I'm answering people. So at Almighty Act One Instagram. Um, shout out to everybody that's listening, that tapped in. Shout out to everyone who supported my music thus far and will continue to support it. And you know, shout out to shout out to you. I appreciate you having me on, man, and, and uh, you know, spreading the word and, and sitting with me and chatting. And, uh, you know, shout out to Canada. Um, I definitely have a lot of people out there that, uh, you know, Jay, shout out to Jay Roberts, Aeon Crux. Like, a lot of the homies are from Canada. I have not had a chance to, to make it out there yet, but uh, hopefully when I do, we can chop it up again. Hey, man, most definitely sounds like a plan. Once you slide across the border, definitely hit me up, man. We can set it up. Definitely, definitely. I gotta say th thank you so much again, Act One, and definitely have yourself a phenomenal weekend, man. I'm pretty sure we definitely shall talk soon. Definitely, man. Close out the summer with a bang. I appreciate you.